there's people camping outside Parliament House in, in Melbourne, in Victoria right now. So they're not just holding up gallows and little nooses and talking about hanging Dan Andrews and shit. They're trying to get a little Occupy of their own going. And it's all, apparently, over a bill. The bill is the Andrews Government's Draft Public Health and Wellbeing Amendment Pandemic Management Bill 2021. Now, I'd like to say a little thing or two about the passage of bills, and I'm sorry if you already know this yourself, but the work is telling everyone, not just having a lefty circle jerk or whatever you are. Bills become legislation and or amend existing acts of legislation. Okay, Now, to do that, in Victoria, they have to pass through the lower house with a majority vote, and then they're sent to the upper house. And if they're voted up there, they're sent to the governor for royal assent, which is basically just a rubber stamping process. So the upper house is really the last stage at which a bill would be stopped or changed. Now, the upper house in Victoria at the moment, it's pretty much split down the line between Labor and Liberal. Actually, that's quite a common occurrence because they're so different and all. Three minor party MPs therefore hold the balance of power. What's that? That's the ability to decide on any bit of legislation either way. Cross benches, as they call them, yeah? They can cross the bench. Now, those people are Samantha Ratnam of the Greens, Reason Party leader Fiona Patton, and Animal Justice Party MP Andy Medic. They hold, therefore, the power to change this bill because Dan wouldn't be able to get it past them without their say-so, and they're not members of the Labor Party, so they don't have to do what he said. Do you see? You do get all this now, if you didn't before. In order to convince Andy Medic of the need to make amendments to the Public Health and Wellbeing Amendment Pandemic Management Bill 2021, COVID denialist members of the Freedom Movement, look, they attempted a bit of political diplomacy. They sent him this letter and a possibly diseased condom. And they've been making death threats to all three politicians. And they're outside Parliament with gallows and shit. And they haven't read the bill, of course, you know. They're only going off of the fumes of stuff that con artists have told them about it. <laughs> so right now, I f do find it hard to summon up too much care for their concerns about a bill because they don't understand it. And again, they've been summoned by con artists and opportunists. So instead, I will actually explain the actual amendment, actual bill. That's right, we're not going to do the usual thing you do when you get your news which is you know doing a google search to get a sky news clip of peter credlin reading out lines written for her by someone else who themselves did a google search to access a news.com.au article no we're not going to do news that way we're going to look at the actual bill together all 116 pages of it yay in brief, of course. Now, for recommended changes to this bill, I'm not going to look at what Peter Credlin says or any other media or commentary or news.com.au. I will look only at the recommendations of the Human Rights Law Centre. Who are they? The HRLC is a fiercely independent pro-human rights legal lobbying and strategic body they are extremely trustworthy. Your mate on Facebook with the Dandrews CCP noose memes is not extremely trustworthy. But let's get into the weeds. The purpose of the bill, it says, is A, to amend the Public Health and Wellbeing Act 2008 in relation to the effective management of pandemics and B, to amend the Public Health and Wellbeing Act 2008 in relation to fees for detention of persons in quarantine during the COVID-19 pandemic and C, to amend the Infringements Act 2006 to broaden the scope of what constitutes special circumstances in that Act and the Fines Reform Act 2014 and to make consequential amendments to those Acts for the purposes of the Concessional Infringement Scheme in the Public Health and Wellbeing Act 2008 and D, to make consequential amendments to other Acts. Hey, first of all, let's have a look at the HRLC's take on this law overall. They say... 
it's a significant improvement on the current law and incorporates many of the changes the HRLC and others have been calling for. Huh. However, they say, improvements are needed to ensure a best practice approach. Victoria has been operating, for a bit of background, under declarations of a state of emergency since March 2020. State of emergency laws actually have fuck all requirements for transparency or oversight within them. And they just aren't designed for a long-running pandemic. And that's what we've just been going through. This is why people have been calling for changes, for more oversight and transparency resulting in this bill. So how this would work once these legislative amendments are made is first the Premier gets to make a pandemic declaration. This isn't about banking specific orders, just declaring the pandemic state. The bill states that the Premier must consult with the Health Minister in the CHO before doing this declaration. It also says he can make that declaration whether or not the disease is present at the time in Victoria. Huh. Saw a bit of Lib's commentary about how they could decide uh, to declare a pandemic if there was one going on in Romania. Well, not so much, because if we consider that they have to seek out the advice of the health minister and the CHO, and they have to publish that as part of the pandemic declaration, you can imagine what it would look like if the Premier said, well, look, I'm going to make a declaration of a pandemic because someone is sick in Romania and had attached advice from the CHO going, yeah, it looks fucked in Romania, bro. You should totally do that shit. It's probably not how things would work. So this is seen as an improvement on the show being the one who does the declaration, as is currently the case, because the Premier is accountable to you at election times, unlike the show. Do you see? You see? You can vote him out if you don't like what he does. The HRLC say these changes significantly improve transparency and accountability for key decisions made in a pandemic response. Cool. Thank you, HRLC. Pandemic declarations have to be in writing, be specific about areas, the disease or potential pandemic, and set a period of time not exceeding four weeks. But they can be extended. Premier's discretion, as many times as the Premier wants. And that's a potential fucked bit, okay? Fucked bit alert. The HRLC say that given the extreme powers that can flow from the making of a pandemic declaration, it's reasonable and appropriate to set an outer limit on the ability to extend it. Now, there's no word yet on whether this has been changed, but conceivably, you could also meet this goal by making the requirements for declaring and or extending a pandemic more stringent. So let's move on to that. On that subject, reporting to Parliament must include the reasons for the order and include the advice of the Health Minister and the CHO. And whenever you get a declaration of a pandemic, you get a specific advice, as I said earlier, from the CHO and the Minister relevant to it. That's an improvement here. Again, more transparency in Parliament. Good. However, there's a fucked bit. Fucked bit alert. About the Premier's ability to declare a pandemic if he's satisfied... If there's no reasonable grounds mentioned in there, that just means if you're personally satisfied. And remember, we're talking about heavy powers here. You need checks and balances. So the HRLC say the bill should be amended to require that the Premier be satisfied on reasonable grounds that the pandemic be declared or declaration extended. Good news! Samantha Ratnam, Andy Maddock and Fiona Patton secured these amendments, according to Ratnam's recent thread. We've not seen the details yet, but they've purportedly secured a commitment to a stronger threshold for declaring a pandemic. How did they do it? Well, I'm told Samantha Ratnam sent Daniel Andrews a death threat. No, just joking. They did it because they hold the balance of power. Thank you to the crossbenchers. Once the Premier does a pandemic declaration, the Minister can issue a pandemic order. Order. That's where all the extraordinary additional powers we know and recognise from 20 months of a pandemic and emergency orders and such kick in. You know, restriction of movement, limiting entry, requiring masks, quarantine powers, yada, 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 full communism. <laughs> you know these powers, I've been using them already. There's not much difference here. It's just structurally different to issuing opaque 
and constantly renewed states of emergency. These pandemic orders can apply to anyone, but also to specific categories of specified persons with certain attributes. Hmm. That means attributes within the meaning of the Equal Opportunity Act 2010. Well, yeah, so this is officially a fucked bit. Fucked bit alert. Peak fucked bit. Is this giving Andrews the right to target more black people like he did when he locked down the Kensington Housing Commission Tower in 2020? Obviously not a power you want them to have. Don't take it from me. Take it from the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commissioner, Roe Allen, who issued concerns about this to the Attorney General not long ago, according to the Herald Sun. It is the Commission's view that the bill should require pandemic orders to be compatible with human rights in the Charter. Or, of course, take it from the HRLC. HRLC say this bill should be amended to expressly require that the Minister properly consider and act compatibly with human rights in the Charter. <laughs> of course. They also recommend that the bill can only discriminate on attributes with a clear nexus to public health, like, say, oldies in aged care centres. You can't give yourself a ticket out of adhering to the Equal Opportunity Act because of a virus. Kensington Housing Commission, my dudes, never forget. Never again, please. No thanks. Frankly, Andrews plus cops equals no good. This needs change. <gasps> Good news! Samantha Ratnam, Andy Medic and Fiona Patton secured these amendments according to Ratnam's recent thread. We've not seen the details yet, but they've purportedly secured a commitment to applying the Charter of Human Rights to all orders and actions. How? Well, simple. Fiona Patton sent a diseased AIDS condom to Daniel Andrews. Ha <laughs> ha! Just joking! It's because they hold the balance of power in their crossbenches, dummy! Dan can't do shit without them. And more on oversight. The Scrutiny of Acts and Regulations Committee can, under a narrow set of circumstances, report to Parliament that they don't think an order is in line with the Act or is compatible with the Charter of Human Rights. HRLC's take is that this is a win. All scrutiny and oversight is good. More eyes over more powerful de declarations and pandemic orders is very much needed. It increases public accountability. More on oversight. The Independent Pandemic Advisory Committee also exists as a kind of oversight or advice body. Yay! The idea is that if you declare a pandemic, you should make a skilled body of overseers from the community to help advise on orders. Now, the HRLC say both the involvement of the SARC, the Scrutiny Committee, and the establishment of this new Expert Advisory Committee would improve the oversight and scrutiny of key decisions made in the pandemic response. Okay, good. There's many other voices out there calling for the SARC or the expert body, though, to have their veto or oversight powers improved. Yeah, the SARC should have stronger oversight powers. <gasps> Good news! Samantha Ratnam, Andy Medic, and Fiona Patton secured these amendments according to Ratnam's recent thread. We've not seen the details yet, but they've purportedly secured a commitment to stronger powers for the scrutiny of acts and regulations committee. I'm told that's because Andy Medic constructed an elaborate gallows on the back of a trailer and drove it around Dan Andrews until Dan Andrews agreed. Just joking, they did it because they're crossbenchers, independent of the Labour Party, who hold the balance of power in the upper house, so Dan had to communicate with them. Do you understand? Okay, fuck bidding coming. This is about detention powers. The Act sets out authorised officers who can detain people. The HRLC recommend very strong safeguards around the use of these powers because the people often appointed as authorised officers are like, you know, Parks Victoria staff or other public servants, often with limited training or public health experience. So specifically, they say to amend the bill to give people who get detained by those authorised officers the power to access, like, an independent body on board to review those decisions, like a VCAT or something. Also, there's a power to force people to answer questions set out in these authorised officer powers. 
So the HRLC doesn't dispute the occasional need for this in a pandemic response, you know, because sometimes people might hold the key to, you know, something that would lead to a a terrible outbreak of something, you know, mega triple Ebola, but insists given the weight of that power, because that is a really strong power, then it should be given ministerial oversight and approval before being deployed. Now, there's been no word on whether reform has been secured on this. Indeed, that's why it's been the subject of debating question time between Matthew Guy and Daniel Andrews yesterday, because this is apparently one of the few remaining areas even worth discussion. The rest has all been made quite reasonable. So I'm interested. Watch this space. So this part outlines penalties for shit like not complying with pandemic orders or directions listing the penalty units or fine schedules. A subsequent bit goes on to clarify and legislate hardship criteria for the fines, which are sometimes astronomical. So HRLC's recommendation is to remove a section of the bill which discusses aggravated offences, which means astronomical fines or jail time. HRLC say that the section of the bill needs clarifying or limiting because it could apply to vastly different types of public situations, including protest situations and we do need to limit Vic Pol and government powers in relation to these situations because they have absolutely been heavy-handed in policing the pandemic so far and speaking of protest another HRLC recommendation was to expressly provide that it should not be an offence to leave home for the purpose of a protest that is otherwise compatible with pandemic orders the government have used pandemic powers to ban COVID safe protest actions. I've seen Vic Pol give astronomical fines to people doing fucking car convoy protests about refugee rights, for fuck's sake. They should not be allowed to use pandemic orders in that way. Good news! Samantha Ratnam, Andy Maddock and Fiona Patton secured a couple of good amendments according to Ratnam's recent thread. We've not seen the details yet, but they've purportedly secured a commitment to significantly reduced fines, which is good, and the right to protest being enshrined in regulations. Now, apparently the word from inside Parliament House is that that all happened because your auntie's Facebook feed of dictator Dan memes had such sway with the political class that they all changed their mind and they realised that they were just about to enshrine full communism. Just joking. It happened because of the three crossbenchers who hold balance of power and therefore bargaining power. See? No word on amendments to the aggravated offences section yet. Still a concern. Watch this space. And by far my favourite part of all this, and an absolute win, I think, it's quite unfortunately quagmired by the rest of the hysteria, safeguards for contact tracing info. This is great. We're talking about the disclosing that information to coppers part. This is about restricting that. The exception is if you're about to hurt someone or yourself. I think that's reasonable. Hit me in the comments if I'm missing something there. Now, HRLC naturally take this as a huge win. These safeguards were urgently needed. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic carrying on about the government tracing apps precisely because of this and because our concern was that they'd hand this info to the coppers. And that's precisely what's gone on to happen sometimes. The intention with this is to stop that. This is good legislation. It eases the concerns of civil libertarians significantly. I love it. The HRLC love it. You should love it. Anyone worried about copper oversight when they check in will love it. I hope every state hurries the fuck up and adopts laws just like this pronto. So most of these needed changes to this bill were sought and obtained, we see. How? Well, because of the gallows and Craig Kelly and the diseased AIDS condoms. Just kidding, lol. Because of independent human rights bodies issuing calls to amend the legislation, and because of Samantha Ratnam of the Greens, Andy Medic of the Animal Justice Party, and Fiona Patton of the Reason Party, working in good faith with the Labor Party. Thank you to them. 
Here's something Samantha Ratnam just recently said concerning all the emails her office has received over concerns to the bill. I'll read through parts of it. The thousands of emails I've received in recent weeks have demonstrated a very genuine fear, and I understand that people are scared. But what I've noticed is that almost every email or phone call or social media message has contained some form of misinformation or conspiracy theory, gross misrepresentation of the bill we're debating. And this is something the campaign to oppose this bill has to answer for. This campaign has deliberately and maliciously taken advantage of people's fear and uncertainty and whipped them up to a genuinely heightened state of terror, disconnected from the reality of what's actually happening in Victoria now, and indeed the reality of this bill. It was completely irresponsible for Upper House MPs to speak at recent rallies and not condemn the threat on our lives when gallows and nooses were brandished as part of them. We've seen these Liberal and crossbench MPs decry the pandemic laws as a gross violation of our human rights, but where are these so-called freedom fighters and human rights champions when 46 men continue to be, de- to be detained at the Park Hotel for being refugees? Nowhere. The vultures pointing these people in a political direction right now for personal gain are having a field day because now they can make people dance in a way that readies them, shapes them to participate in more political matters ahead of next year's federal election. That's what people like Craig Kelly want, of course. Of course. But those vultures don't want them to understand this bill, or any bill, or any amendments, or what a balance of power means, or the power that those three minor party crossbenchers had to affect change. That's not what they're for. They're not for educating. They're only good for making angry at whatever they're told to get mad at so that they can squeeze votes and loyalty out of them. That's all they see them as good for. These people are pawns. They're ruled by fear in their pawns. And their unchecked aggression, just so you're clear, is dangerous not to politicians. It won't be Dan hanging on that noose. It'll be nurses, doctors, frontline workers, cashiers, baristas. That's what we're already seeing. It's up to us, actually, to protect each other. That's why I'm attending this weekend's rallies across Australia. I'm actually speaking at the Brisbane Calf event. I think we need to start getting organised for when they get more violent to frontline workers. I hope to see you at the rallies. They're on Saturday the 20th of November. The links are in the description. Thanks for your support. And if you think anyone would benefit from this clear-eyed review of that bill, then please send this video along to them.